We have a special guest I discovered a while back because his company is called The Assertive Group. And as you can imagine, I was very excited to get to talk to him. He's also someone who is a professional negotiator. He's been negotiating with pretty serious people uh, and organizations in Europe and across the world. Now, he also does a lot of inspirational speaking. He's a conflict resolution expert, an entrepreneur, and a writer. I'll share a little bit about his books at the end. His name is Professor Steve Alban Teneo. Here's what I find really interesting about you, Steve, is that your background is in investment banking, yet you're very committed to do the right thing, to ethical negotiation, to reduce violence and injustice, to support children and the vulnerable. And it's not something that we see that much in investment banking. Having those two sides, you have the emotional, vulnerable, kind side, but you also have that background where you understand the money, the ambition, and you bridge those two things. That's why I'm really excited to have you here. So welcome, Steve. Thank you so much, Ivna. Thank you very much. And welcome, everyone. We're going to talk about what emotions can do in conflict resolution and in negotiation, which is one of the expertise areas for Steve. So Steve, tell me more about that. Why is this important? Why did you come up with this specific topic? So thank you very much for the question, Ivna. Let, let, let me just go back a little bit for the listeners and especially the younger ones. When we talk about negotiation, we talk about investment banking, everything looks a little bit shiny and it looks where we're strong and, and well-driven people. But we all have a background, especially the one that, that tried to do peacemaking, which is a little more vulnerable than it appears. And I work with a lot of great negotiators that actually went through difficult moments in their life. And these difficult moments have taught us actually much more than just going into a classroom and trying to learn how to be a negotiator. So my road was really bumpy, especially from a young age and with all the love and respect for my family, but it was quite dysfunctional. And so I had to learn different, different themes, one being resilience, uh, one being empathy, and one being how to survive in an environment that was, was challenging in many ways. So that's the thing, because a lot of people, when you look at the Chris Voss and the everything, and we think about superheroes and we talk about FBI negotiation, and there's another world out there, and, and it's the world of emotions. It's the world of the human, the, real, the human capital that we have. And, and, and I'll go through a few of the things that made me study and a few of the mentors I had, which their work was a key inspiration in learning about the emotions. But I'm going to say something quite simple, Ivna. It's that every conflict is emotional. Otherwise, it is a disagreement. And of a very rational solution can be found. There's a disagreement between you and me about the color of my sweater. It's a nice red. You believe it's a nice blue. I would say it's red, then we just have different rational ways of analyzing it or so taking a third party and just making uh, each other understand what are the rules and conditions and everything. And then someone uh, is going to, uh, it can be arbitration, it can be a judge if there's a conflict, but we'll avoid that going into a big disagreement close to a conflict. Otherwise, it's just a mediation process or something that is just going to balance everything and say, look, Steve, we've analyzed the color and we went through scientists and, and it's blue. And, but I didn't take it personally, and you didn't take it personally. Now, if it goes against you, because I talk about something that you find aggressive, or you take it personally, for your reason or my reason, maybe because I said it badly, or because it's something that, I don't know, if you have a complex about your nose or your hair, and I say something, and you take it as that complex, and you say, why is he insulting me? And you feel that it's, and it becomes emotional. And it becomes that big thing or we feel anger and there's something wrong and we don't really know how to handle it. That's the source. That's the seed of conflict. And when you look at the, the civil mediation, for example, with all of this divorce, you just listen to both parties and you understand the amount of anger being one of the source emotion. You understand the, the size of that anger that they have and how the mental, which we might call the ego, the mental, with that uh, dominating power, wants to win, wants to control the situation, is taking that anger to want to win over the other one. And you completely lose the humanity 
or the feeling of who are you fighting against? That rage, that emotional reaction. So when you're high emotion, you're low rational, the prefrontal cortex is going down, the limbic and the reptilian are taking over. And suddenly you have that rage, you say things that you won't remember, you change your voice, you change your verbal and power, your nonverbal and paraverbal, even if you don't change the verbal, and then you're another person. And that's in most of the conflicts, we can see that a lot of this, I work a lot with psycholo psychologists and psychiatrists. I've studied a little bit their fields, not to become one, but to make sure that I would know which question to ask them. When you're in a complex situation, facing someone that seems to be very much in pain or dysfunctional or very angry and just know what kind of question I need to ask them. So they give me a little bit of a diagnose, diagnose just to make sure that I can direct the conversation in some way. And that is actually a key to everything. Just remember the next time you were emotional about something. Just simply take someone that when you face that person, you're very emotional with. So you repeat in the morning, oh, I'm going to do, go to talk to my boss and I'm going to tell him this and that. And suddenly that emotional pressure builds up. There's something happening and you're in front of your boss and you cannot speak. There's not a single word coming out. You forget about that. And so this is a very important reaction when you're emotional, your cognitive charge is saturated or can saturate very fast and you don't remember or you lose the rational intellect. And so you go mostly into more anger because you blame the other people. Oh, when I'm in front of you, I feel terrible. So it's your fault. When it's actually the other one is the mirror of yourself. And so when we've been studied that for, for over 20 years, and we see how people are emotional in all aspects, and even in current conflicts, we see that the wars, I'm not going to give any specific because I try to be apolitical, but still there's the human behind. And we see how people choose right and wrong. There's one guy that is the bad guy and the other one is the good guy. And then if the other one doesn't abide in your side, then it becomes the enemy. If we're at war because we're pro-Palestinian or pro-Israeli, and then we don't even see the big picture anymore because we're emotional. So the, all the biases that we have, the, the whatever biases, there's 108, I think, they come and then there's confirmation. And then you only look at the, at, at the information you want. And then the algorithm on internet is making you even confirm more what you believe. And then you start being completely emotional and you don't listen and then you interrupt. And then every time you have a reaction, it, it's protection. And so we've studied this for a very long time and very deep and in, in, in a lot of situations. And there is, when you say there's a misunderstanding, even that misunderstanding is misexpressed and misreceived, right? That's the core of a misunderstanding. So it means that you have to find what happened for you to say the things you say, maybe the wrong way, and the other one to understanding the wrong way. And the, the reason why we called it Know Yourself, the little methodology we've created, because if I would ask you, Ivna, what is the best negotiation program in the world? You can tell me the 10 main programs, the 10 main things, People would say, oh, in that program, I've learned that. And in that program, I've learned that. So the question would be, what is your profile? Are you hyper empathetic or are you more rational? Are you more this? Are you more emotional? What kind of negotiation you want to learn? Because you cannot do all kinds of negotiation. You need to choose who you are and that act accordingly. Same if you're a painter, same if you're a lawyer, same if you're a banker. When I trained this Formula One drivers, for example, we did a lot of mental preparation for these people. And so I would never teach them about driving. I don't know anything about being a professional driver. So I would actually turn to the other side and I would train them onto many other things. And so we'll talk about this aptitude attitude later. So I don't know, let's find a, a few words. Resilience, belief, emotions, limits and conditionings, fears, value and characters, commitment, then the value of experience, uh, empathy, emotional intelligence, innate talents, creativity, intuition, spirituality. They're very attitude 
and their less attitude. So they're much less rational than they are emotional. So I specialized, or I wanted, I studied, and I still study a lot about this emotional intelligence, which can be badly used, but it is in, 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 in the context of when you interact with someone in a negotiation, you can be as ready as you want on the rational aspect. If you don't connect to the people, if you didn't create the link, if there's no bridge between you and me in complex negotiation, then I might miss it. If I speak too much and I don't receive enough, if I don't understand that maybe you're in a situation where you're about to be fired if you don't bring back that contract. And there's so many little aspects that are emotional. We can call them interest. Uh, in French, we call them enjeu. It's normally something that is emotional. There's so much of that that you realize that you're not only negotiating something, but you are negotiating with someone. And that with someone in our life is actually more important than what you're negotiating. I'll give you, we work a lot with the engineering school in Lausanne, which is in the top 10 of the big engineering school like MIT. And so 85% of the startups that fail, it's because of a conflict between the founders. It's not the tech that didn't work. It's not the ID. The rationale was really good, not the emotional part. Suddenly, it's me against you. I do more. My ideas are better. It's just the ego, the mental taking over and just saying, I feel at risk with you. You make me feel vulnerable because you're challenging my position. Because these people haven't been trained to handle conflict, which when you train people to handle conflict, then suddenly they find it actually quite interesting because there's so much creativity. You're from Brazil. I'm from Switzerland, Ivna. Just imagine just the difference between, and you, we both whites with, with dark hair. We, we could actually be exactly from the same neighborhood, but just imagine your, the educational difference, family difference, religion, then social uh, environment. All of this makes your experience so rich that if I negotiate with you, I can be absolutely wrong by making the wrong assumptions about you because your reality and mine, even if we look similar, might be absolutely different. And then if I challenge you or you challenge me and it becomes emotional, then suddenly you start protecting yourself and then you cannot have a fair, authentic, uh, shared discussion. So uh, I'm sorry, it's a long answer. My wife, Sonia, would tell you, never ask Steve a question if you don't have 30 minutes for the answers. I'm lower than 30 minutes, but it's important to, to give a little bit of content in, in what, I, uh, what I explain. Now that's great context and there's and so much richness in what you shared. I'm intrigued by a couple of things. The first one is that in a negotiation, in a conflict situation, we have to manage our own emotions because if we're too emotional then we can lose our rationale and logic. But at the same time, emotions are important to be able to connect with others. When we are emotional, what should we do to handle that in that negotiation or conflict situation? And the second one is when you see the other person being emotional in that conversation, if they're in pain, if they're angry with you, if they seem upset and defensive, what can you do? What questions can you ask to manage their emotions as well? Wonderful questions, Ivna. Thank you so much. That's another 30 minutes. <laughs> so let's start by the second one. There was a, a book written in the US in the 1970s called The Course in Miracle. And there's a sentence in it that Sonia took out and put in our book. Do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? So if you're facing someone and there's a disagreement, do I want to be right or do I want to be happy? Someone is Attacking me in the street, not with a knife, just verbally. Do I want to be right or do I want to win and insult him more and make him understand that he doesn't have the right to talk me like this and having an escalation of the conflict? Or just I realized that the guy either had a very bad day or is very dysfunctional. And so do I want, and that's the reason why our new book, it's called Peace is a Personal Choice. Do I choose in all consciousness to go in a fight with a stranger, a verbal fight, so I'm not saying protecting yourself, and escalating a conflict which has zero sense and zero value in my life because someone is insulting me. So when you're facing someone, imagine, Ivna, that if I would tell you, 
I don't know if it's your real apartment behind. It, it looks like it is. It is. Now imagine, now imagine that I would say that I find the decoration absolutely ugly. How can you live in such a, a, a dump? So if you take it personal, if you feel insulted, I win. Now, who am I in your life to have the power to judge something you like being personal, physical, intellectual, social, why would I let you hurt me? That's the only power. KYF, know yourself first. If you tell me that I look like, look like, I don't know, that like shit, that's your expression of me. You're not talking about me. You're talking about you. You're saying that you don't like this kind of hair, this kind of glasses, this whatever. I don't like your decoration because I like pink, but I'm not insulting you. I'm just saying that I don't like that. You can tell me, Steve, you have the right to tell me absolutely everything in the content, but just be careful of the form. If you don't like my furniture, just say it kindly. You don't have to say that I live in a dump. Just say that you don't like the furniture. Then you don't go into a fight, but you just express yourself to protect yourself. Now, if you go into a fight and then that's what we teach kids. We do a lot with Sonia. We do a lot of, against harassment and uh, domestic violence because Sonia was a famous singer in Switzerland. So she's using her credibility because she went through 10 years of an abusing relationship. She used this credibility to promote uh, subjects around harassment and domestic violence. And so most of the schools, they actually teach the kids how to fight back. But Ivna, if I fight back, I'm actually nourishing the fire. If I tell you, oh, I, I hate your glass, and you say, hey, look at your glasses. And I say, yeah, but you look like shit. Oh, Steve, you look worse than me. Then what are we going in 10 seconds? Now, if you tell me, and we could do it. And uh, tell me, attack me about my glasses and my hair. I have a hard time attacking people. So this is great. This is good training. No, but try to attack me. Try to attack me. Just <laughs> tell me a... that my, my, gla my yeah. glass is ugly. Just tell me this. Yeah, Steve, it's really, your glasses are so depressing. They make you look depressing and like you have no credibility. Oh, I'm sorry that you think that even now, because I think that your glasses go so well with your face that I find you amazingly elegant. Come on, keep attacking me. Do you really attack someone who is not going into the dance of conflict and return you a compliment? We yeah. have these programs in school in Switzerland. The kids, they insult each other with clothes and everything, and you just return your kind with someone. Then the guy, if you're not fueling the energy, everything's energy, emotion, energetical motion. If I don't fuel that energy, it's going to die. The toxic person doesn't want to attack someone who is not dancing that victim executioner, the Cartman triangle, this victim executioner role. You just stay outside of it. If someone insults me because I, I don't know, I just cut the line and I with my car, and I would just wave and I say, I'm sorry. Am I right? Am I happy? Do I want to call him names and be super angry and during the entire day carrying this, oh, this bastard, he said this and he said that. Or do I want to say, sorry, yeah, I made a mistake or maybe he made a mistake. Do I want to be right or do I want to be happy? Now, it doesn't mean that if you have anger and if you feel it because someone scared you, that you don't have to scream in the car. But you don't express emotions against the other one. That's rage. Sonia is doing something in the association. She has an association called Parle-moi, which means talk to me, but it's a little uh, nice way in, in French. Parle-moi means as well through the self. So our book is called Through the Self. It's a holistic guide to bring yourself back to your own consciousness. Every time you will give power to someone else, every time you create a relationship when you become the slave of that emotion, which might kidnap you when you, oh, sorry, I wanted to say, so in that association, Sonia, sometimes when we have family mediation, she has the permission to record and then she plays the tape and people who say, no, this is not my voice. Oh, I don't talk to my wife like this. And this is them. We never edit. We never, it's on the iPhone. And it's terrible because the nonverbal and paraverbal makes that when you become emotional, you change your face, you change your vibration for people feeling the aura of a room then suddenly you feel a change. You feel something. The eyes, the face, everything become, you can just, that's the best example. You're there in front of someone and say, yeah, come on, I'm listening to you. And it's just one very small example. There's plenty of other things. And most of the people, when they are actually angry, 
we don't realize how we communicate non-verbally to the other. We don't realize the tone of our voice. We don't realize the little word or the little sentence uh, that, that, that we can use. And that can be absolutely destructive and detrimental for any relationship. So that is actually one of the things to learn is it's very easy to blame the other one. But who am I? The, uh, that when you ask dysfunctional people, you ask them what's wrong and they say, this person is saying that, this person is, this person is like, and this person is this, and they're all doing bad things to me. And I love the sentence from Simon Sinek or Sinek uh, in the US, wonderful inspirational man that I don't know, but I love his work. And the guy said on a stage, you know why all my ex-girlfriends have in common? All of that, me. And it's actually quite interesting. Why don't you take responsibility of your own reality? If really seven times you're attracting the wrong person, isn't it that there's something inside of you that is attracted by toxicity? If three times you make the same mistake, isn't it something that is inspiring you to do that mistake? Because there's something you need to clean, because there's something in your energy of the past, because there's a memory, a trauma memory or something else. Why don't you just sit down with yourself and take responsibility of yourself? And so that's what we're trying to, to bring people to this KYF reflection, which is a non-dogmatic methodology. We love working. We work with a lot of negotiation, mediation, psychologists, a lot of different things. Just what we want is we just put a mirror in front of people and we say, choose what's good for you and then go there. When the, there's this Zen saying, when the student is ready, the master appear. Find one subject and go, and it's going to open up. Just if you don't like psychology, then go to psychiatry or go to therapy, go to musical therapy, but do something to heal yourself because by all the conditioning you had in your life, then you're definitely not 100% aligned with yourself. You don't have a, a full consciousness and your subconscious or unconscious mind are directing you, guiding you. And they're facts, either medical facts or psychology and, and, and psychiatry are studying that way enough. The, the numbers of people with psychopathologies is very high. Some institutions mentioned that it's way over 65%. And that's not including just depression and the, the other emotional compensation. We're all dysfunctional one way or another. You, there's red buttons inside of me that if there's, you attack people that are very vulnerable, like the children or the elderly, it would be very difficult for me to remain uh, completely neutral and I will have to do something and I will have to act and I will become emotional and I will start judging you. And it's the balance. How do you actually try to do good without doing bad? And, and I don't know if it answers your question. It was a little bit of a wider answer. <laughs> when you shared a compliment, when someone tries to insult you, or if you just smile or just be a nice person. It wor It works. It works with kids. We do that in schools in Switzerland. It works. The little bully, he, he, he doesn't want to waste time with someone that doesn't enter his executioner uh, power. I want you to submit. I want to be right. I want to hurt you. If you don't hurt me and I take that power away, we cannot dance that sadly that dance together. For someone to be narcissistic and submit someone, sadly... Someone is to submit. And so I don't blame them or I don't blame the person submitting because it's often the unconscious mind. The problem is if you've attracted a what they call a narcissistic pervert or a narcissistic manipulator in your life, it's because something was broken. You let him come into your life. If I say one insulting word to you and you let me say it, why would I stop not to say a second one and a third one, and go all the way down to whatever submission. And this is what we're trying to bring to people is, first, don't enter the game, and then go and find help. Start talking about it. Nothing's acceptable. I always, we always say that to children. I say, if I would come to, close to you now, and I would start touching your leg in a uh, bad way, what would you do? And so most of it's sad because some of the people would say, I would not do anything. And you feel that they're already, they, they, would, they don't even have the ID. And most of the people would say, I would scream or I would immediately go and tell the teacher. Or I would, and, and what I try to, to teach them is, but it's the same with words. It's the same with silence. 
it's the same with stealing your stuff. There's not something that is acceptable and something that is not acceptable. And peace is a personal choice. First, you make peace with yourself by understanding how you function, your own emotional strength and weaknesses and limits and your conditionings and everything, and the loyalty you have to some of your executioner, sadly, and you study all of this. And then you can sit down in front of someone and say, look, I feel good, aligned with myself. I can discuss with the enemy, with him completely disagreeing with me, but I'm not going to take it personally. If you say, Steve, you're absolutely wrong. I'm not touched in the core of my education and everything. You don't have the right to say that I'm wrong. Who are you to talk to me that way? I'm actually returning the, the situation and say, Ivna, why don't you just ex explain me precisely where do you think I'm wrong? Because I don't see it the same angle. And when someone is attacking you, you say, ah, the, uh, the guy is starting to be impatient. Can you say, you can't imagine the pleasure I have to have this dialogue with you. The note to that, to, that we have agreed to disagree, it's an enormous plus in my heart. I really love the, the, the conversation with you. Yeah, it, it, it turns down so many things. We, we'll talk later about the power of questioning. I have a class only on questions. This is so important. If you're not, if you're trying to push, if I'm trying to convince you that my way is the right way, you're going to put up all your limits. But if I play with questions and make you see by open, interesting questions that make you reflect about other ways, I can actually bring you to reflect with me. And that's the ethical negotiation is actually we reflect together because there's a lot of things that I believe I know today and I am right, which you can tell me in your life that I'm completely wrong, but you don't know what you don't know. And I need to be open for you to teach me the things that I don't know, especially in conflict resolution. Otherwise you go for a bad compromise and bad compromise would be re-questioned uh, at some point and the relation ca can, be, can be hurt again. Another key takeaway that I had here from what you just said, which is the first one was when we are angry or upset or frustrated, we don't realize that is coming across in, on our, in our nonverbal communication and how that can be destructive. I also thought it was interesting that if we're angry or upset, we can express those emotions, but we can't express those emotions against others. And that's a very fine distinction. We know when we're angry because we feel it here. That's the difference between emotions and feelings. It's a little bit different, but emotion, you really feel here, feel them here around the, the solar plexus. It's like when you cry, how do you feel after you've cried? You're empty, you're good. It was energy coming out and you just let it out. It should be the same with anger, but we're afraid to express anger because of course in our education, we don't leave space for anger. But anger, it's an amazing, powerful emotion to release. If someone cuts your line with a car, keep that anger, you're scared, you pull the brakes and, ah, and you don't do anything about it. You're going to be tense the entire day. It's an emotion, energetical motion. It is energy. You feel it. And then if you don't scream and you don't let it out, it stays inside the body. There's plenty of books, medical books now, with how uh, non-expressed emotions are actually hurting some of our organs. And you know that a trauma is not what you went through. It's not the experience of what you went through. It's the non-expression of the emotions attack, attached to what you went through. That's mainly the trauma memory. And, and so if, if, when in our program, we teach people to express their anger, and which is the most difficult to express. Some people can cry, but especially men who have more anger and less crying, and women, you have more crying and less anger. But you have that anger. If someone insults you, if someone treats you badly, or if someone is scaring you, or if someone is saying something about your children, what do you feel? Suddenly you're like, I, I want to say words to him. I want, but you cannot because he's the boss, he's the teacher, he's the everything. So you keep that for yourself. And what do you do with it? We have plenty of very kind people telling us when there's a bad day at work, I am so nervous that I come home and I talk badly to my spouse and my kids. Why don't you scream in the car? You alone put your favorite music and scream, let it out. They cannot suffer from your own emotional limitations, express this anger. Yeah. For the people who had kids, when there's a baby, 
we see that there's three main emotions. And then you can add a few other ones, but it's anger, sadness, and joy. You give an ice cream to the baby, is in full joy. You remove the ice cream, he goes immediately into screaming. That mommy is leaving, then he goes into crying. Forget the ice cream. You give the ice cream back, forget about mommy. They jump from one emotion to the other one. And then when they reach one and a half, two, two and a half, it starts to create that mental understanding, a little bit of manipulation, testing the limits, understanding things with words. And then if the baby is four and cries, we're going to say, hey, kiddo, you're four now. You cannot cry like a baby. So we're teaching him not to cry. Instead of saying, hey, if you want to cry, you absolutely can cry. Just go into your room. Let it out and come back when it's finished. If you're angry, absolutely. Go to the basement. There's a big teddy bear called anger. You just go and you let it out with the teddy bear or on your bed. And Dr. Daniel Dufour was this amazing head of the war doctor of the ICRC. And I was a student. I was his patient. I was a student. I was, his, let's say, partner in all the treatments. We did so many things together. He sadly passed away, but he wrote the, the, the first part of our book. He actually brought the emotional expression methodology into schools in Geneva, private schools mainly. And so all the schools had almost an 100% success rate at the end of the year, and they're continuing with it. And they had no bullying and fighting. Because suddenly you're eight, eight years old, you have a lot of anger somewhere here. You go, come on, the teacher is saying, go to see Teddy. And you go to the teddy bear and you scream, you let it out. How much can you keep that anger when he wants to go out? When it wants to go out and you don't let it out, it stays. But if it goes out, then after crying, do you want to cry again? After screaming, try in your car. After screaming, you're going to be a little bit stupid for 10 seconds saying, I hope nobody saw me. But then you're not angry anymore. Even if you try to scream, you cannot. Then you're going to hurt your voice. And so for most of the soldiers, we treated people with cancer, with everything. There is a, 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 rea- a relation, direct relation. And in read books, there's videos now on YouTube. It's starting to be a, a big subject. And so when people learn about handling th- these own emotions, I know that if I have to negotiate with people that are actually quite tricky, manipulative and everything, I'm going to take a moment to try to scream and let something out. And I'm going to try to completely relax myself and prepare myself to be attacked, to be manipulated. So I don't take it personally. And then the people I work with, there's a little sign. If I touch my hair, they take me out of the room. I'm becoming emotional. I cannot continue the process. I'm going to, uh, something is triggered in my brain. The, the limbic brain is trying to protect me, created something emotional. I'm not going to be the calm and rational and low voice, reassuring everybody. Don't worry. We have the process. Whatever the disagreement today, we'll invest time and we'll decide. And if, if I cannot be that guy, take me out. It's always best to let that expression of anger, frustration out in an environment where you're not taking it out on anyone. And then coming back to the negotiation, the conversation, level-headed, calm, in control. And I like the tactic of having someone who is your partner in that conversation to signal when they notice that you're getting too emotional so that you can exit yes. in that moment. But try it for yourself with very small things. Just try when you're hurt by some, someone or something. And then when you feel that there's a little bit of that emotionally outburst, you know, you're ready to have it comes and you like, you know, you feel tension to just go in and your pillow, just go and scream, just let it out. And take, put yourself in the present moment or in touch your, uh, your physical body, the, the sensory body. Just try to bring yourself there and just let it out. And you will see a few seconds after, you're going to feel like after a huge laugh, you're like tired. That's when the energy is out. And try it. Don't trust me. Don't believe me. I'm nobody in your life. Just try it. We see wonders. There's more and more methodologies coming about this. We start to understand that we are emotional beings. Studies are coming out from many of the top medical universities and everything studying this. It's not just we are emotional beings. It's impossible not to be emotional. If you had one day you're heartbroken, you understand that it was the emotional being broken, not the rational of, oh, I lost the one meter seven three and the blue eyes and the, no, it's the emotional. 
you feel you're never going to recover and you are, you're like, no, I'm never going to fall in love again. And you go through all these emotional stages going down, acceptation and trying to go up. Same with when there's someone dying, we are emotional beings and they are in conflicts, a huge emotional parameter. Yeah. And that I had when I was in my corporate life, a situation I was really angry. And what I did was exactly what you shared before I went off to talk to this person who was a superior and tell him that it wasn't acceptable, what, I, what he did for me, I didn't feel it was respectful. I went outside where there was no one else and I had my heels at the time and I just stomped and marched in the same place for a while. And I even punched the wall. Nobody saw this, but it was enough for me to calm down and immediately go speak to this person and we solved yeah. the issue and I was calm in that moment. So it definitely does help. And I can think of a situation where I yelled at someone and regretted it yeah. later. And I can think of the situation yeah. where I ex let that energy go, like you said, and had a really great conversation afterwards. The problem, Ivna, and thank you very much for that example, because th th this is key. If you would have gone in front of that person with the anger, you become emotional because you are emotional. Remember, when you're high emotional, you saturate your cognitive charge, your limbic brain are taking over, prefrontal cortex is going down, and suddenly you don't remember. So you're in front of the person and you've been a freeze. You either fight, flight, or freeze, right? The, the three F. So suddenly you're in front of the person and, oh, I don't know what I wanted to say. Or you start being clumsy. And you're not absolutely clear in your mind and assertive saying, okay, look, this is how it is and blah, and I want that. And this is, it. you can start to be, yes, boss, I wanted to say, I'm sorry. I don't want to annoy you. And you start becoming emotional. And this, the other one feels, and especially if it's a manipulator or someone, a very strong, no empathetic person, then he actually might hurt you even more. That's the reason why. And, and, and I know I share that with most of the negotiators that, that are giving lectures it's 70 percent of our world is preparation you don't go talk to an emotional person without being prepared i always have documents in front of me i always have questions i always have my documents ready because if suddenly you ask me a question that i'm a little bit lost i just want to bring me to something rational and let, let's do like this so my negotiation documents are 16 pages if i'm attacked by someone I would just bring something emotional, rational, very fuble. I just go into something. I turn page two, show appreciation. And it's written, express affiliation. And I just come back. Sir, thank you very much for your comment. I really appreciate the relationship we have. I still believe that the last part was the limit of the respectful relationship we can have. I respect you very much. I would like to keep on. And it's written there. I don't have to fight with emotions. It's written there. Bring yourself back to something rational. And then it cuts. The, sometimes uh, uh, Sonia would laugh. But well, you have to speak with her once. Every time there's people fighting in the street, she's like, oh, come on, Stevie's doing it again. And I just go and I interact with them. And I think I'm not telling them to stop. I'm just actually giving them a tissue and say, stop two minutes, you, you, you're bleeding. And I just remove the bleeding and takes them out of that emotional stuff. It goes down. And I go to the other one. Come on, stop. You're bleeding too. I don't talk about the other one. I talk about them. If you're bleeding, you want to stop. And then I say, come on, you can fight again. And the guy, they go into the fight and then stop. Say, hey, you should maybe stop two minutes. Now your heart is beating. You're going to hurt yourself. Ah, I'm gonna, he's going to hurt. Now it's protection. And I calm them down. And I don't know how to fight. I've never had, I had a gun to training, but I'm not a cop. So I'm not here to shoot. Or I don't have that institutional power. I do things by playing with words, by playing with psychology or with emotional intelligence. Connecting to people and, and interacting just to make them, when you're very emotional into a fight, you're, oh, you're completely in it. Someone brings you back to reality. You're like, oh, I didn't realize. It's just that goes down, that turns down. Like when you have someone very angry in front of you, don't try to bring rational. He's not going to listen to you. Then let him express. And that's when you ask questions. I, I don't know. Things, oh, it seems that you're angry. Would you like to tell me more about your anger? There's maybe something I missed. Would you like to really express your anger and tell me everything? And you just take notes and you're interested. And the guy's blah, 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 blah. And after, what do you do after two minutes of being angry? After two minutes of crying? 
it goes down. And then suddenly emotional high, rational low, suddenly emotion going down, it takes a few seconds to, and I'm like, I absolutely receive everything you say about this anger. I would disagree on a few points and I'm gonna explain you, but I receive you. I receive you, not I understand. Oh, I've lost my mother. Oh, I understand I've lost mine. Is it really the same? Can you really understand this? Don't try to patronize people. Don't try to take power of them, over them. I receive your anger, sir. Let's work together towards it so you find a great solution. Maybe we can even find a great solution together. What about if we find a shared common objective here? I receive all your anger. I actually even share it with you. I'm not going to express it the same way, but I share your anger, sir. And you're assertive and you just go with it. It's going to go down to your level. Go into a fight and sit not facing the guy like this, but next to him. And you in planes or in airport when people are angry, I go next to them. I say, what's happening? We're late. What's happening? And you go, yeah, blah, 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 blah. And he starts turning his attention to me. All his emotional stuff. Oh, yeah, this is really bad. And with this airline, we're always late. And wait, stay here, sir. I'm going to go and say something. And I go to the lady. I look at her and say, just come into my game. I'm just going to calm the guy down. And she's, she pretends to speak with me. And I go, Jay, she understands. She apologized. You're absolutely right. Why don't we sit down and we try to find a solution together? The guy is cut from his anger. I'm not talking about really bad anger and the kind of, let, let's all do step by step. We're not going into that direction. But for these small, very emotional reactions, we are all human and we all have the kind of same anger. And we need to leave space for the person to express it. I tell you, someone, if you really, someone that is angry more than one or two minutes, there's really something deeper inside of it. There's really something of a trauma that needs to express. Then you need to hand, handle him a, a little bit differently and maybe protect the people that he might verbally abuse or physically abuse. But one is just a little someone in a shop doing a little crisis because of everything. And who do you think? You're just a salesman and, we, and, da, 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 and I'm the client and you just call your manager. This is just small stuff. You can turn all of this small conflicts in, at the office. You can turn that very easily by just receiving their emotional, emotion, energetical motion. It's energy which needs to go out. Just push it a little bit. Just have them. Just Give them space to have the right to be a little bit angry. Just after, poof, it just comes down. A lot of people that I talk to and work with from the corporate world share that their team members often come with a lot of frustration and anger from their yeah. broken relationships within the company and internal little fights and conflict here and there. And that they spend a long time venting off their frustration, saying, oh, this person's mean, this person's not doing, this person's hurting me, this person hasn't included me, they're leaving me out of these situations, and it's not fair and unjust and all those things. So from what I hear, what, what you're saying is, ask those questions to help them release that, that frustration, that anger, and then let them express that. Hopefully it's two minutes, five minutes, not too long. And then say, I receive your anger or I share your anger. And then no, match... don't share it. You don't, don't say... share. You don't have the same. No, you receive it. You receive the anger. You, 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 you're not sharing it with him. Oh, yeah. You don't have the same Just, anger. That's right. Look, Ivna, I respect you for everything you say. Is that a good feeling to hear? I respect your anger. That's a very good thing to. Oh, I absolutely respect your anger. Do mm. I understand it? You're immediately saying, how do you understand? Have you been fired? No, I'm uh, not, but I understand because I was fired. It's not the same thing. Oh, I absolutely respect your anger. I, I don't know if I can understand it, but I receive it. I receive every bit of your anger. Then you're not creating something of an argument. You're not trying to go into an argument. I was training. Uh, I work with a few universities and I was. Uh, some of them are in Ukraine. So I go there normally every month and I was training the special forces in, in uh, one city, which is at, at the, the border with the war. It's really the town where the soldiers would go out for the weekend and rest there. But they have a new problem there. Imagine that you've been in a war for two months and you have five days to rest. So you go to, to, to that city. You're traumatized. It is very emotional. You've lost some of your friends. You're seeing things with your eyes that we cannot even comprehend. Then you go into a bar. You have a few drinks. It releases the bur boiling emotions, right? There's des desinhibition of what you feel. 
and then they have a gun. So suddenly they draw their gun out. So now the problem we had to handle was the special forces came to the training because they didn't want to shoot them. They said they are our soldiers. They are our friends. They're highly emotional. And what they're going through is highly traumatizing. If they draw a gun, because one was executed and he was filmed on YouTube by, by a police officer in the middle of the street. And he was a father with his wife and three kids. But he was threatening people with his gun. And so how do you actually turn down a situation, which is very extreme? Huh? We didn't find one proper way of doing it because there's many ways. But how to make them understand that the person is only communicating? How do you actually receive his anger? How do you compliment it that he's a soldier? How do you thank him that he's actually taking something and just to calm it down, just to not draw your weapon now? How do you actually, you've seen this video in the US, we, we don't have guns in Europe as you have in the US. So you see when one is coming and the, the police officer is screaming because the guy has a gun. So it's, yeah, go on your knees, you everything. How do you want the other one? There's not even a room for something to calm it down. If someone is screaming at you, go on your knees, go on your knees and insulting you. And what, what do you do? You're angry, you have a gun, you're dysfunctional for whatever reason. And someone is telling you, I have more power of you. I want you to submit. You resist because your ego is going to say, look, I'm already going through so much, man. You don't understand my pain. Just shoot me. I don't give a shit. And you need to calm people down. And that's the reason why we call it pieces of personal choice. Because you have the choice to be right or you have the choice not to be happy, but to be peaceful in the resolution. Last week with Sonia, we gave a conference for the European Union for a women organization. But there was a lady which was part of the European Commission and she was a high ranked uh, lady. And we were talking, she came after the, the, the conference and so she was saying, oh, this is the, the most inspiring speech we had in a few days, giving a few compliments. But she told me, Steve, there's still something I have to tell you. I think that the only way we can make peace with uh, Russia is to give more weapons to Ukraine and that they win. And I very kindly, I actually would agree to disagree with you. Now you're speaking about war. The day you want to talk about peace, why don't you just give me a call? They're organizing a peace conference in Geneva now at the request of Mr. Zelensky, which I'm pretty sure is a good, I'm not ap apolitical. I talk about war as it is, and they're not inviting Russia. So now, how do you want to talk about peace if you're not inviting the other side? And this is all these things where we understand the all limitations of our beliefs, education, political system, and everything. But at least don't bring that into your family. Don't come at 7 p.m. with the anger of Mr. Smith doing something stupid in the conference room and hurting you. And then you give it on the keto because he's just, hey, daddy, I want to show you something. And you just throw him away because you have that anger. That, that is where we can start building a kind of a better society. It's by bringing people back to themselves and just say, hey, look, at least take that responsibility. The, a lot of people, they really like talking about my great, some of the great negotiations I've done. I was lucky enough to be close to a few of the international organizations in Geneva. So I work with a few presidents and everything. But I love to talk that I was a broken kid. I was lost. I know I went through a depression. I made, I had a few failures. I went through that whole learning curve. And when they asked me, what is the most difficult negotiation you've done in your life? I said, it's the next one. Because I'm just human. That if Sonia would be in the hospital and I have to negotiate something, I would not feel good enough. I would be emotional and I don't know, maybe I'll miss completely something. And, and it's just this kind of things that is one big chapter of, of the conference I give is humility, where I trick people with very small exercise about the, the, how the brain is, is, uh, is functioning to show them that we only see a fraction of the reality of what is. And I, by bringing all of that arrogance of saying, Look, I really like the UN and I'm not blaming the, the institution, but I work with a few. One of the program we have is actually we give an emotional intelligence classes for UNITA, the University of the UN. It's the first one they ever accepted. So it's small, but it's there. And I worked in the Maldives. I, I, we worked quite close with the former president. And so th that was something quite interesting. Um, when we did, we wanted, well, they, they asked me to help them during the, the state of emergency in 2018. I worked really with the, very closely with the UN, the Maldives UN ambassador in Geneva. And then it was called there and it became the person in charge of the crisis. 
And it was quite interesting that the gentleman from the UN, a white man, went there for six days trying to tell them how to function because he was white and they were dark skin and he knew how it would be when there's an Islamic state with some of the extreme are literally the only education they had were Quranic schools and kind of limited ones. So how do you want to go there and say, look, you have the charia, but we're going to tell you that it's wrong. We're going to tell you that you need to hug each other and be kind and sit down around the table. White people are against that we actually even, there's a wonderful philosopher uh, in France called Aurélien Barraud, and he went to do a conference at the MEDEF, which is the boss conference, or the boss of the, the big company. And he was saying, you guys are still talking that we are the leader of the revolution and we are the solution. What you don't see is we actually, we might be the problem. The model we've created in capitalism, the way it is, and I'm absolutely not socialist, communist, but I'm not capitalist. Why would, would we go to the extreme? Why do I have to choose between Israel and Hamas? Why would we always have to make a choice? There's so many other things we have to try to create a better society, to build humanity different, to integrate the less fortunate. I'm a white guy born in Switzerland. Studies are free. You pay maybe $500 to go to university, plus maybe $2,000 for material and everything. To be to have a master in Switzerland in five years, it would cost you less than $10,000. So I come, my father uh, was the dysfunctional one, but I, my mom was a state worker and we didn't, we were not in a bad situation, but she couldn't have afforded university in the US and everything was paid. So my reality compared to most of the others, just imagine you're from Brazil, you know how difficult it is for the, the middle class and the lower middle class. And I come from that, that, that lower middle class. So when you look at it, just who are we? What is the world? How can we try? I'm, I'm not against being abundant. The, the logo of our the foundation we have, which is called Vision for Peace, it's W3. It's win. Because today you cannot make, hey, Ivna, you win, I win, and the other one are dying. We're really talking about extinction, or maybe a possible sixth extinction. So I'm not being all ecological or all everything. I'm just trying to understand society as it is, bring a little bit of the human being in it and say, look, we're not victim of the world. We've created that model, like in Russia or in the communist countries, they've created a model that was highly dysfunctional and it took years and years to change it. The model as it is today for a small group of people to really cannibalize everything at the cost of literally humanity has to be changed as well. I'm, I'm not a... a uh, I'm not an economist or I'm not a, a, a sociologist, so I cannot change. And I have a few ideas or I, I'm part of a few reflection groups and I give a lot of lectures where I can and a lot of time for free to try to bring my, my little seed where I can. But we have no choice. Today, when I walk home, I know all the homeless in our neighborhood and I go sit down with them. There are actually people like me that had sometimes just a little bit of bad luck, something breaking inside of them. And you lose everything. And where do you find hope? I lost hope a lot of times in my life. I failed. There's a nice Zen saying that the master has failed more than the disciple has e even tried. And bringing the human back to that core, that self, that humility of things. That's the reason why I, I don't like the, too much the compliments. Like I don't really like the insults. They're not touching me. Because if I feel good because you tell me that I'm super handsome, it means that I give you the power to make me feel bad if you tell me that I look shit. And with all the respect I have for you and for most of the people, I don't want to give people that power. Do I feel good with my little blue jacket, with my little shirt, with my glasses, with my haircut? Honestly, when I look at myself in the mirror, I adore myself, but not for any of this trait. I adore myself because of the resilience because it was difficult, because it was not fun, because I always accepted my mistake. I apologize to all the people, uh, even in the first part of the book, I apologize to the people that I've heard if I hurt them, some people I know I hurt, and some people I don't even know. And I adore myself for that. Not because I look better or I taller or I'm this or because of that. You make money, you lose money. You're this and you're that, and it changes. And it's time for us all together 
to choose that peace is a personal choice, you make peace with yourself because if you're not aligned with yourself, you're going to emotionally compensate. You're going to let that dark shadow power of yourself, which might just be anger. I look at you. I just want to hurt you, Ivna. If I'm a little bit manipulative, I can say, I, I don't say it's the truth now, but I can say three words and I break you. That's what I hear. I hear people saying, I'm going to break her. I'm going to humiliate her. Just really? I have that sentence that, that I say very often. What would love do now? I try to teach bad people. Let's take someone that you really love, like your daughter. Right? They all have families. And I'll explain you a nice story later uh, about how you can touch people. So you are, he has a daughter. I'm going to say, what you're about to do, how would you explain it to your daughter? And the guys, they're completely lost. What would love do now? You're about to kill someone. You're about to steal something. You're about to go and explain it to the person you love the most. If you're okay with it, if you tell your daughter, look, I'm just about to do that. And I tell that to mediation. And I say, look, John, why don't you go and explain your daughter that you just told me that you want to destroy her mother. Just go, take the responsibility. Absolutely, you're right. You have to destroy your wife because of all the things she did wrong. Just apart the fact that you actually cheated and lied on her, but that's not important because you told her, right? Man, they really like that. When they cheat, they're like, oh, but I told my wife. Ah, yes. So your guilt, you, you transferred into her pain. That's very respectful. That's peace is a personal choice. So go and tell your daughter. Come on, she's the one you love the most. You want to protect her. You believe that the mother is a bad mother. Go, just go say that you're fighting so the mother would not have custody of her. Just, just go. And they're all confused. And they're like, yeah, but no, but I cannot. But okay, so I, at least if you cannot say the truth, is that there's something wrong. We try to touch people emotionally to make them react. That's the reason why I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. They, well, I'm not doing therapy. I'm doing a little bit of that action therapy, which is triggering, provoking something in people. Amazing stories, giving people perspective by having them think about how someone that they care about but, uh, would, would interpret that. I can give you a very sweet, I can give you a very sweet story, which was a very difficult one for me. When I was talking to this people from the Maldives, I had a discussion one evening. They had something in their Sharia, which was the death penalty for girls that are raped starting at age seven. And it was taken in all the newspapers. A lot of people were actually against the Maldives for that reason, but they were using wrong information and wrong photos. It was actually photos from Indonesia and other things, but that's not the point. So I spoke to a lot of these people about this and they didn't really understand why, but it was like this, it's Sharia. So if it's Sharia, it's acceptable. So I had this guy coming once in Geneva and he was one of the leader of one of the extreme right, right in Islamic community, they're all on that, that, that religious side. And I took two daughters of one of my close friends. One was 11, the other one 13. And I knew his daughter was 9, 10 or 11. So we go in a hotel, in the lobby of a hotel, in the bar. The girls, they sit at the next table. They don't hear the discussion, but they come, they hug me, they cuddle me, they go back. And I play the emotional side. It's very sweet and they play with him and they are. They hug him when he arrives. So the guys, when they're outside of the countries, these people can be very different. And suddenly I play a little bit of a role. We were talking about this and I said, show me the picture. I think her name was Aisha. Show me the picture of Aisha. And so he took the picture and I looked at him and I say, so you're telling me that if I rape your daughter, your friends are going to kill her. And he became white. That's the first time that I touched something inside of him that triggered that denial he had in his mind he had never thought that he could apply to his daughter never because it's just yeah it's sharia it's death penalty it's never going to touch me so he actually went called the former president president wahid they linked together and they changed it to something uh, i don't know how it is now i, I haven't uh, followed that the, the last two years but that he went to seven years to 18 then death penalty was transferred into 200 Flogging and then non-applicable, something like this. So it's still there, but non-applicable. I regret a little bit that some of the European press would not have actually taken it just to show that you can change the mentality that someone, they, they just didn't realize it. They didn't realize it, what they were doing. They didn't realize it, that it was written somewhere. One of their whatever leader said, this is how it has to be. And that's it. 
And so this is what I always try to, that's the reason why I ask a lot of questions. And I'm genuinely very interested about the people. When I'm in a mandate, I speak much less than now. I listen and I question a lot. And it's, it's really to understand what is it that they understand and what is it that they don't understand? What is emotionally touching them and what is emotionally not touching them? And that guy never thought that it could apply to his daughter. Never. Because, of course, you cannot think about this. And so in, in wars, most of the people were protecting one side over the other, and especially if you're your side. Oh, no, my side is not killing civilians on the other side, which from outside, you look at, whoa, both sides are killing civilians. Both sides are uh, behaving badly. So I work a little bit with the ICRC. And so we had a call with the, the head of Ukraine, Red Cross in Ukraine. And the gentleman said something quite uh, fascinatingly painful. He said that there is the same number of attack on civilians from the Ukrainian side to the Russians than Russians on Ukraine. So there's not a good side. It's war. The soldiers, the everything, they find the enemy. If you don't kill it, it's going to kill you. There's not a good side. I don't blame anybody. And I don't say that war is not justified or justified or everything is wrong in all of it. It's just that when you look at the civilian side of it, we work with a few Israelis and it's very difficult for them to believe what we see on TV and, you know, about whatever the, the genocide word and about what South Africa did. And, you know, they, they really into their story and which we can understand. They have their own story. Now, what I would try to do without judging is just trying to create a bridge between sides, communication. Because if you want to free hostages, you need negotiation. It was proven one more time. The only hostages relief was when a time when negotiation were on. You don't rush uh, the other side, expect them to say, oh, we are about to lose. We release the hostages. And if we have to die, they're going to die with us. But that war mentality, which is very emotional, it, it becomes very personal. And it becomes political when it's your role in politics. It's your election. Then it's emotional. Then you want to win. Do you want to be happy? Do you want to, you understand that kind of, we still have only an hour, but you understand the circle. And it's the same at every level, small level, big level. It's the same. Uh, the, the few very important people I work with, and normally when they called me, it was because the clever people around them didn't find the solution. So they called an external agency and, and we come in, but they were very emotional. Some of them, I diplomats, they even cried. When the door was closed, they cried. And they say, I can't deal with this anymore. Just It's too much. It's touching my family and everything, and I cannot. Wonderful. Let's start there. Uh, and we don't realize that. This has been phenomenal. Thank you for sharing all these stories. And it really shows that emotions can be used for negotiation in the right way, but also knowing how to control our emotions and be able to bring that rationality to the conversation, but acknowledge other people's emotions and work with that is, is very powerful in conflict situation and can bring a lot of perspective as well. Like this example that you shared about the girls in Maldives, it's a lot of food for thought. So, so thank you for that. And pleasure. where can our listeners go deeper into some of these? Cause you have so much content and thought around these wonderful stories from your experience as well. You have your, your books and one coming out. Where can our listeners find more about all of that and learn more and go deeper in their negotiation skills and their emotional intelligence and their conflict resolution? Thank you very much, Ivna. The But first on your channel, but the first thing, thank you very much for that wonderful hour with you. They can connect with me on LinkedIn with great pleasure. I normally answer most of the messages that I receive, if it's not immediately, but I normally take the time. The, the second thing is I give a lot of conferences, lectures. Uh, I've sent you the program for this year. I normally try to have four or six specific conferences and I play around. So I do less in the US. I, I do a lot in Europe and in the Middle East. But if there would be an interest, I would definitely love, because I love, the, I, I lived actually in New York and I studied in the States, so I, I love the US. It's just that you guys have a, a couple of superstars and it's, it's not easy for European people to come and being well known into your market. So we stay a little more discreet in, in our side. So 
There's our book, True the Self. Uh, it's on Kindle. Um, for, the, for the people fascinated about this, I even it's 99 cents and it goes to Sonia's association. But if someone cannot pay it, I'll be very gladly, I would offer it uh, with great pleasure. If the students or anybody that do not want to pay, I, I'd offer it because it's a, it, that book is created to inspire people to find themselves. So yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great thing. And then I'm not really huge on social media. For two reasons, it's um, I'm much older than I look. I know I look 25, <laughs> but I, I'm definitely uh, over 20 years older. So it was not really my my thing. I don't have a YouTube. I do a little bit on, on LinkedIn, but that's the only thing. But I offer uh, a lot of a lot of conferences as well, especially for association, for groups, for schools, for anybody interested. So we have a negotiation class as well, uh, which there's a book of 200 pages, and then the, so that's the Aptitude, negotiation aptitude. That's the Harvard 15% is aptitude, 85% is attitude. So we need to learn the rational one. And then most of the attitude, it's mainly uh, workshops and classes. I do, I've separated my time. We've created a few companies where I'm really involved, where I use the negotiation skills. So that's pretty much 60% of my time. And I try to still do a little bit of diplomatic and humanitarian work for 20% of my time. And I love giving classes and conference, which is pretty much 20% of my time. And it, it depends. And I'm going to keep this because I think it's very important. I love the sentence, each one, teach one. So every time there's a class that some of my friends are doing, I register and I participate as a student because there's still a lot of things I learn. And, and on the contrary, to the opposite, I really love sharing what I've discovered over the years. I've done over 800 missions on the field all kinds of different mediation, facilitation, negotiations. So it's really a lot. I worked undercover for eight years. So there's plenty of little amazing experience that I can share. I don't pretend to know much, but, but for what I know, if I can share, if I can inspire people to just dig. I worked with Formula One drivers, with Olympic champions. So I've learned a lot from them, how they triggered a few things to actually go where they were the best and some of the things that didn't work. So just connect with me on LinkedIn, whatever you want, send a comment, send a smiley, tell me what you need, what you want. And I, I always keep, I'm very well organized. So I always keep at least half a day a week to answer or to do Zooms or interact with people. Just each one, teach one. So I had, <laughs> I had great people inspire me. And if I can inspire a few, that would be, that's my little contribution for changing the world one way or another. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Your work and everything you've been doing in your career in itself are very inspiring. I find it inspiring. And I'll make sure that I link below in the description box, Steve's LinkedIn page, website, your latest book. I'll, I'll give yeah, yeah, I'll give you the link to the book, uh, the, the Amazon link. That's right. With great pleasure. And it, it's really 99 cents and it goes to the to Sonia's association. So if you want it, it's a nice companion. It's really an holistic way to bring you back to your own consciousness with doors and subjects, very simply written, two page per subject. Just so if something talks to you and wow, you've put in words, that's what people say. You've put in words, some of the things they felt and they didn't really know. So then they can dig. And then you know how YouTube is precious. There's a lot of great content. There's a lot of great people. So learn actually... Should really become a lifestyle. Yes, absolutely. And that's why we're here. Absolutely. And, and thank you so much. It was wonderful. Anytime, Ivna, with great pleasure. And thank you all for uh, coming to the end. I know that maybe you cut before, but if you're still listening to us, you are really patient. Thank you so much. <laughs>